Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Good morning, and you're very welcome to this morning's Signpost uh, webinar. I'm Pat Murphy, coming to you from, for once this year, the sunny southeast. Uh, delighted to see the sun making an, an, an appearance. This morning, we're being joined by Morris Deasy. Morris is a postdoc researcher uh, work, uh, working on uh, feedstocks uh, for uh, anaerobic digestion. Morris, you're very welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, you're doing some economic analysis on the, and I suppose environmental analysis on on potential feedstocks for our anaerobic digestion industry. That's the that's the pro- that's the fleet project you're working on. Yeah, exactly. So the fleet project we're looking at from the farmer's perspective, really, uh, about the economics of feedstock production, the environmental footprint, uh, and the transport modelling. Um, but very much farm level, using National Farm Survey, kind of looking at. How does it suit a farmer and what effect could it have in terms of economics and, you know, greenhouse gas emissions as well? Look, look, look forward to that. If you can get start to get ready to, to uh, put your, or with your presentation. Uh, Maeve, delighted that you could be, join us uh, once again. Hopefully this this uh, week we won't leave you on your own. A, 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 a power out of my, my broadband has happened last week. So ho- hopefully we can we can both stay together. Uh, OK, if you're ready to go ahead, Morris. So really, we'll just go through anaerobic digestion and the Irish context, the policy in the space and nitrates and the derogation. And then the trust of what we're looking at then is renewer, the EU consultation on renewer. uh, And that's all about converting organic manures into chemical fertilizer, the criteria for renewer. And then what effect would renewer have on dairy farming in Ireland? Is it practical? Um, so this isn't law yet, but it's just an analysis to basically look at it and should we be discussing it. So anaerobic digestion, uh, and we're talking a lot about biomethane these days. Uh, so anaerobic digestion is just a big metal stomach. You take in things like grass silage, slurry, processed waste. That can be food waste. That can be industrial and um, things from the food processing facilities. All that gets digested. It creates biogas. That can be upgraded into biomethane, that can, which can then go into the gas grid. It can be run to use trucks uh, or a biomethane tractor, which was a demonstration in Grange this year. Um, the other side of it is that you get a digestate out, back out of the AD plant. So what you're harvesting is carbon, uh, methane. You still have all the nutrients there. And that digestate should go back to farmland. And that's part of the circular bioeconomy. Um, other questions that come up, what is digestate like? We'd say typically cattle slurry is around 6.3% dry matter. Digestate is around the same 7% liquid, macerated. Uh, so you're using the same machinery to spread it, basically. Uh, but it has better fertilizer value. So policy context. We had a biomethane strategy, which has been launched. Uh, the target is 5.7 terawatt hours of biomethane by 2030, which is 10% of our current natural gas demand. So it's a sizable chunk of gas. Um, and they're talking about 200 to 250 plants around the country. So quite a lot of infrastructure. And we also have our climate action plan where we're looking to cut our emissions in agriculture. And that's very much where our research is looking at how much does exporting s- s- cattle slurry from farm, how much does that reduce the farm's carbon emissions, basically? Uh, and the other context, uh, when we're talking on the top right there, is a pie chart. This is from the SEAI. They're looking at the resources to actually achieve this target. And basically, while food waste, industrial food waste are, are important, they need to be used. The large chunk of things to get to 5.7 terawatt hours, the large chunk of energy is going to come from grass silage, well, grass clover silage and slurry, cattle slurry, pig slurry, all of those slurries. Um, so that's why we've in our project, we focus very much on agriculture. Let food waste be food waste. That's a different sort of side of things. So nitrates derogation, nitrates directive and the derogation. So each farm has a limit of 170 kilos of N per hectare. That's across the EU. We have a derogation until 20, April 26, where farms can go, go up to 220 and 250 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. So that's organic nitrogen. We also have a chemical nitrogen budget, basically. Um, and that depends on crop, on organic stocking rate. So, for example, uh, at a stocking rate of 170 to 210, a farmer can apply up to 254 kilos of nitrogen per hectare. So that is in the derogation territory. And that is that budget is to grow the crop to feed the cows, basically. 
so those are important numbers in terms of this uh, presentation to 170 and then the derogation at 220 and 250. So existing nitrates regulations, if we're using that example of a, of a farm just slightly in derogation, you've got that organic limit of 170. So they're above that and they have a chemical budget which they can use to grow the grass to feed the cows, basically. So theoretically, if that if that farm was to export slurry to an AD plant, it would create biograss, it would create a digestate. He could say export everything above 170 to, to get underneath that 170 limit. But actually, he wouldn't be allowed to re-import that digestate because that digestate is considered an organic manure. And once you go above 170 kilos of, of nitrogen per hectare, of organic nitrogen per hectare, you're not allowed to import organic manures anymore. However, you're still allowed to buy chemical nitrogen. Um, so this is where this EU consultation on renewer came. And what renewer stands for is the recovery of nitrogen from manure. So renewer. Um, and it's basically, it's around that how do we recycle and how do we make better use of waste streams uh, and organic fertilizers? And they're looking at it in terms of strengthening the EU's uh, strategic autonomy and food security while increasing sustainability standards. And um, so this is, it did come out of the war in Ukraine where we had such volatility in fertilizer pr prices. So can we use that to reduce farmers' exposure to that mineral fertilizer and to close the nutrient cycles? That's circular bioeconomy. Rather, let's complete the circle and have the nutrients coming back to farm rather than importing, which say nitrogen, which is made from fossil gas, which is coming out of Russia typically. And, and can they do that to ensure availability and affor affordabilities of these fertilizers? So that's why they're, they were assessing basically what are the regulatory and non-regulatory steps to enable the recovery of nutrients from livestock mature, manure. And, th and this is, if you think of it in the context of places like Holland are actually filling boats full of slurry and exporting to other countries and at the same time are importing chemical nitrogen. That's not a sustainability or a circular by economy uh, win, basically. So the consultation on renewer, it's about amending the nitrates directive. And basically what it's based on is that these renewer fertilizer have a similar nitrogen leaching potential and agronomic efficiency to chemical fertilizers. So if these reduce the risk of nitrates loss to the water compared to manure, so thanks to that environmental advantage, states would be allowed to um would be may authorize above the above the amount of 170 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, a separate additional limit of 100 kilos of nitrogen per hectare to be used from these processed livestock manure. And that's basically to reward farmers for that sustainability um, and that you're not importing this nitrogen. The So in the current situation, this is the same slide again, essentially, a farm at a 170 would be exporting, could export, if the derogation was lost, for instance, they could export everything above 170 to an AD plant to create the biogas, but they wouldn't be allowed to re-import that same nutrient but they're allowed to use that chemical nitrogen. Whereas in the new context of renewer, a farmer with the same cows could export everything above 170 kilos of nitrogen per hectare to an AD plant. As long as that digestate was processed and reached that renewer criteria, the farmer would be allowed to take back 100 kilos of nitrogen. This would come from the chemical nitrogen budget. So that budget down the bottom left it's still you have a chemical budget of 254 kilos of nitrogen per hectare, but the farm would then only be using 154 of that in, in terms of a high soil fertilizer. They'd be re-importing 100 kilos of this renewer. And so it's still the same limit. It's just that you're using some of your organic manure that you export from farm. So that's closing the cycle, keeping it all circular. So the criteria for renewer uh, needs to be consistent quality across batches. Uh, and the key criteria really are that mineral nitrogen to total nitrogen ratio of 90% or organically bound carbon to total nitrogen of no more than three. So once those two, either of those criteria are reached, they're saying that this is effectively a chemical fertilizer. It's behaving like that. And um, there is limits on copper and zinc uh, per kilo of dry matter, which actually, if you are very efficient with your digestion, you might end up with very low dry matter, which might be an issue actually, which could be visited as well. Uh, pathogens needs to be low, very low levels of pathogens in it, and that would need to be tested. And the other criteria is that member states would have to ensure that livestock numbers and manure production do not increase as a result of the application of this point. So we're not talking about going to a fully housed system and feeding cows TMR. We're talking about our existing system. Can we keep the existing number of cows 
and could you actually look at um, doing renewal and re recirculating this system? So, so the other criteria is that the current draft actually restricts it to certain technologies. These are ammonium salts or scrubbing salts, uh, mineral concentrate from reverse osmosis, and nitrogen-rich phosphate salt, struvite. So actually, a lot of people who I've discussed would actually dismiss renewal because they said those technologies are way too expensive and not applicable to Ireland. They don't see it being uh, being used. Whereas actually, the JRC report that this draft uh, is based on, this draft consultation, actually also include a centrifuge separator. And these are actually affordable um, and available. There are centrifuges in the country. So potentially, there is discussions basically around that. Uh, and equally, in the consultation, the likes of Ghent University were saying, why are you specifying the technology uh, that it goes against what they said was it goes against a widely supported view that materials should be evaluated based on their composition criteria and not based on a recovery process. And that would be to allow innovation to let farmers and industry come up with the most efficient way of reaching that criteria uh, and not specifying that we have to use certain maybe expensive processes. And um, so that's why this is still in consultation. There is discussion going on going about it. So what we were doing was, look, we said we'd analyze the dairy farms um, in the country uh, using the National Farm Survey and essentially look at could renewal be in an alternative to the nitrogen derogation? So could the farm export slurry to an AD plant that they would get a certificate for the, ni for the nitrates in terms of nitrates, in terms of the nitrogen that they've exported, or if they could get a contract for supply for winter storage requirements? The other one, the AD plant then would process and provide certificate analysis for that um, organic manure and achieve the renewal criteria. So therefore, the farm could re-import the digestate. That would be replacing chemical fertilizer usage on the farm. On farm, you'd also need to use covered storage, low emissions, and spread from the 15th of March. So there'd be a few slight changes in the system. Um, so yeah, so we use 2022, so the National Farm Survey, or the NFS, um, and we profiled the dairy farms in terms of the organic stocking rate. Uh, so the farms below 170, they're not in derogation. The ones from 170 to 220 kilos of nitrogen per hectare and the 220 to 250 kilos of nitrogen. And you can see in terms of average areas, and, and we use the averages within each of those sections, basically. So the average area generally increases and the number of cow also increases. And um, so that's... Yeah, so that's how we're going to profile the, the farms, basically. Uh, and within that, we kind of looked at, okay, well, what's the organic nitrogen load on the farm and what's the chemical nitrogen load? Uh, and I would caveat that this is actually from 2022 when chemical nitrogen was at record uh, prices. So essentially, we do there is a chemical nitrogen budget there within the system. The average farm isn't up at the upper limits, basically, of what they can apply. Um, but it all comes down to the total nitrogen per hectare, really. That's one of the key drivers. Uh, and the other one actually is there's a little clover in the top right because we can get chemical nitrogen, we have organic nitrogen, and we have biological nitrogen if we use clover. Uh, so we could use reduce our chemical bird nitrogen usage further by using clover. So in terms of renewer, look, this we kind of looked at the derogation farmers, all the farmers above 170 that would have an issue if the derogation was gone uh, from April 26. So we're looking at how many weeks of winter slurry would the farm have to export to, which, to get down to that 170 limit of organic nitrogen per hectare. Uh, and for those two categories, the 170 to 220, they're talking about exporting 11 weeks of slurry. The higher higher uh, organic stocking rate, they're talking about exporting 24 weeks of winter slurry. Now, that's if you think of in context of 18, 20, 22 weeks of winter storage, that 11 is very achievable in, in my view. To 24 weeks, that is probably at the limit um, in terms of the winter storage. Now, there is slurry at the shoulders of the season, perhaps possibly as well, but they are within the realms of possibility, basically. That's the key thing. And the other bit that we looked at was the quantity of slurry nitrogen that they couldn't re-import. So if the, fir if the farmer is seeing lorry loads of slurry leaving the farm, can does he have the space in his budget to re-import that nitrogen? And the answer is yes. There's no, For those farms, on average, there's no farm that wouldn't be able to um, re-import pretty much all of that slurry, basically, uh, in terms of nitrogen. 
The other one is in terms of transport. Um, so is it feasible to export these quantities of slurries? And this is in two from two perspectives. One is the slurry needs to be fresh for the AD plant to actually extract biomethane. If the slurry is sat there in a tank for a year, the methane has been emitted. There's no value in it for the AD plant. So it, can we keep the slurry fresh? But equally in terms of road traffic, are we talking about a lorry leaving a farm every day or is it much less? And what we were looking at in these categories was we we're looking at about two lorry loads of slurry leaving a farm on average a day or sorry, a day, a week, um, which to me isn't that mad. Uh, we're not talking about a lorry a day. We're talking about two lorries a week. For those larger, higher stock farms, maybe two and a half lorries a, a week. Um, so that's compared to how often a milk lorry leaves. That's not mad. So in total, we're talking about 21 lorries, nearly 60 lorries. Um, so it is, a, it is a reasonable amount of movement of material. Uh, and that's where we'll really stress how much water is actually in the slurry. Can we keep that to high dry matter slurry uh, and good nutrient content, basically, to make sure and keep that road traffic down, basically, and keep things efficient? So in terms of water quality um, and our organic loading and water quality, so the AD process would process all, they'd be processing the slurry and providing certificates of analysis. And basically means when that digestate is coming back onto farm, we can use that in nutrient management planning because we'd actually know the NPK value of it. So a farm could apply exact amounts of nutrients rather than applying a volume of slurry and assuming that it's average slurry or it's high quality or it's low quality. Because we're not measuring, we're not managing. So I think that would be that would be one improvement. In terms of reimporting digestate, this would need to be in a covered store, would need uh, low emission slurry. And they are talking about spreading from the 15th of January. Once our soils are warm, once there's a crop to grow, because this is a fertilizer, it's not a slurry anymore. You don't need to apply it early to, to let it break down. This is ready as a fertilizer for and the plants need it, um, which is probably what we're going to talk about of storage as well, that we need, will require more storage to take this digestate. Um, and more storage, but also not in a slatted tank. This needs to be a covered store. And um, that's very important. The other one is slurry from the shoulders of the season. We've had a very wet um, winter. So if if at the shoulders of the seasons, farmers are housing the animals at night to reduce uh, poaching and compaction, this could be a benefit for soil health, reduce the amount of damage. But it, one of the issues is that now you have more slurry in the system. But if there's an outlet in terms of exporting to an AD plant, that could be of use. Uh, and the other one would be to incentivize high dry matter slurry, keep water out of slurry as much as possible. Because um, the AD plant doesn't want to be transporting water. It wants to transport dry matter because the dry matter is what creates biomethane. The other one is that essentially in that context, I think the AD plant would incentivize um, high dry matter. Uh, and that if farmers change practice to keep high dry matter slurry and keep water out as much as possible, that would actually create more uh, space within your system. Your stir storage would actually go a little bit further. Um, so in terms of organic load distribution, so in one sense, I see an AD plant as actually a nutrient distribution hub uh, and the concept of a co-op, a collaboration with farmers. Because, and, there's, and there's a couple of points on this. One is on-farm uh, nutrient concentration. Grazing platforms in a dairy situation generally have a higher stocking rate and have higher organic loading, basically, than, say, the silage grounds. And particularly if there's a distance between the silage ground isn't on the home farm, if it's on an out block, there's a distance. So a farmer tends to spread the slurry on the home block because why travel to four or five miles with a tractor? It's going to take time, cost, depreciation, diesel, all of these things. And I think that's a huge difference with an AD plant. If you've got a lorry coming, it's already on the road full with a full tanker. And if you're putting in additional storage, do you put it on the out farm? Do you put it on the silage ground a couple of miles away? Because for the lorry driver, he doesn't mind where he delivers it. it. It's irrespective whether it goes to the home farm or not. So I think that it could help with the on-farm concentration, uh, which would be good for water quality, good for soil health. Uh, and the other one is between farms in terms of high stocking rate, low stocking rates, arable farms. Some farms don't have a huge amount of organic nitrogen usage on the farm. So could we then distribute it that more of the slurries are going to where it's needed, basically, and take away some of the hotspots? Um, and that's really comes down to that collaboration versus competition. So is it a collaboration between the different sectors within farming that it's not, for instance, dairy farms trying to rent more and more land because they need this on 70 organic stocking rate? but actually saying, that's fine, I can send a slurry to an AD plant and it can go back to you via the AD plant. Uh, and that creates trust. So it's not more, it's less about competition, people competing to rent land, more about collaboration and saying, well, I can use some of your slurry and 
you've got enough slurry and nutrients on your own system. Uh, so I think that'll be very important. The other one is just replacing chemical fertilizer, and that's good for greenhouse gas emissions. So it, with certificates of nutrient content, a farmer getting slurry knows what's in it. They can fertilize a crop based knowing that they have an NPK value on it, not assuming that it's, it's watery or that it's thick or that it's good stuff or bad stuff. There's a certificate, so it takes the guesswork out of it. Um, and then contaminants and biosecurity. This, I'm very much talking about agri-AD plants, which are probably not using dealing with food waste or things like that. Uh, and biosecurity um, in terms of pasteurization and what's we're not spreading uh, diseases around the place. So in conclusion, really, what we're talking about renewer and dairy farming. This isn't in law yet. This is a consultation. Um, but I think it's technically feasible for the average dairy farm in derogation to export slurry uh, to an AD plant and achieve that 170 kilos uh, of organic N per hectare. Caveats are assuming that there's an ABD plant locally. We don't want slurry moving across the country. Um, and the other big question is, do farmers see the benefits of AD and biomethane? Very much the, word, the feedback I've been getting is saying, no, the, the AD has no benefit to us. And I think this is the point of presentation is saying, look, it could have it could have a benefit. Yes, you can go and rent land, you can reduce stock, or you could export slurry to an AD plant. That's a viable solution to, to manage the derogation and manage nutrients. Um, and assuming AD plants will will take the cattle slurry, um, generally AD plants have invested a huge amount of money, circa 20 million into a plant. They don't want to be filling it up full of watery substances. And um, so will they actually want to take cattle slurry? I don't think that's necessarily a given. Um, and this is where when we're talking about a co-op model, uh, could the farmers be involved and could we get all the stakeholders in a local, local circular bioeconomy involved? So any industry in area farmers in an area, could you get them all to collaborate basically in a co-op that basically the nutrients get shared, we deal with our environmental issues and we improve water quality, reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I, I just think if there's foreign investors coming into the country, the chances of them looking to try and sort out the issues for the farmer, they're going to try and make as much money as possible for their investors. And so I, I think there is scope for this co-op system. Uh, in terms of changing in farm uh, oh, I'm sorry, there's another one in terms of pasteurization requirements for cattle slurry. There is an issue if we're talking about agri-AD plants, which are dealing with silage and cattle slurry, there is a requirement for pasteurization of cattle slurry, which if the pasture, if the AD process pasteurizes the the slurry anyway, that might, might consume about 35% of the biomethane from the slurry. So we do need to look at that and we do need to do more work and study on what does require pasteurization and what does not. Um, and to keep keep risk lows, but also keep our greenhouse gas emissions. There's no point in us moving slurry around the country and then burning it in pasteurization if it's already been pasteurized by the process. Um, the other one is changes in farm practice. We You would be looking at a covered store for, for storage of digestate because it's high in nitrogen. If you leave that open, that nitrogen is going to be emitted off into the air, and we don't want that. You want that nitrogen to grow a crop. So that's where covered storage will be very important. And then high dry matter. We don't want to be trucking water around the place. Can we keep water out as much as possible that we have a high dry matter slurry that that's what an AD plant would actually want to use? So there we go. Thank you very much. Hopefully you enjoyed the presentation. Thanks very much, Morris. Yeah, a lot, a lot to think about. Uh, questions remind people that uh, Q&A, uh, uh, the Q&A is there. So put in your, your, your questions and I think questions are starting to arrive there. I suppose uh, uh, one to take up a, a point you made at the end, the loss of, of nitrogen from the digestate, in, if it's uncovered, uh, what what form is that? Is it ammonia? Methane? That would be ammonia, yeah. So, so ammonia. typically you get the question is like, and how I would see it is basically if a farmer had the infrastructure, uh, so if you had a, a covered store, a lorry would arrive with digestate, pump it into your store, and then suck up your fresh slurry and then leave the farm. It's not sufficient in terms of road transport. And that's, but the question is most people say, oh, could I not put it in your slatted, slatted tank? And it's like, well, no, that's an open store. Now you're going to be losing nitrogen up through the slats. And you don't want that. You want that nitrogen there for when you're, you want to spread the digestate in March and April on a growing crop. So that's where covered stores is important. But I, like most places, there is a view that we're going to need more storage anyway. If we're getting wetter and wetter winters, more storage is not a bad thing. The cost of it is an issue now. That's that's yeah. Farmers have as 
you know, you're investing into more storage and it's not increasing profitability. It's just giving you a little bit more space. But as long as we start using those manures more efficiently, that is a benefit for water quality and and, and productivity. You know? Okay. And I, I suppose you, you alluded a lot to the potential for, a, 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 I suppose, a cooperative approach amongst farmers or, or maybe even beyond that, maybe the need for a cooperative approach if, if this is to work. Uh, is it something that you've talked to the dairy co-ops about where there is a, a already a, a, a cooperative structure uh, and it would seem to be also in their interests to, to get involved here? Of what kind of reaction are you getting from them? Yeah, look, if anyone's interested, my phone number is online, my emails are there. I'll chat to anyone about it. No, I have engaged with the, with the dairy co-ops um, because I think this is important for the farmers. I can see the advantage for farmers, particularly in highly stocked. If they could get together with 10 or 15 farmers, you could centralize that slurry, process that slurry and send it back where it's needed. But equally, dairy co-ops, meat factories, all these industries that are dealing with food, they also have a waste product that needs to be dealt with and should go back. Those nutrients should be recycled. So could you combine the slurry with your waste from industry? And now you're helping both things because for the dairy co-op, they're sorting out their scope three emissions because by the farms taking the slurry off farm, you're reducing your methane emissions. And that can be 8 to 12% of farm emissions. So you're doing a sizable chunk on reducing your scope tree emissions. So I think there's a benefit to the co-op. I think there's a benefit to the farmers. I think there's a benefit to Ireland Inc. as a whole, basically, in terms of exports. And actually doing, you know, moving into the 21st century where, you know, an LCA on the litre of milk will become a thing. So that's important. The pushback I get is that, you know, people are saying, yeah, Morris, that's a great idea. Everyone should be involved. But that's complicated. You got multi stakeholders. And I was like, yes, it is complicated. You got multiple stakeholders because your slurry is coming from farms, you got waste coming from industry, and you're possibly selling that gas to another industry. But it could help us to decarbonize transport, heavy goods. The lorries going around collecting milk could be run off by a methane. That's a positive story. And I suppose even further to that then is community. If these are plants being built around the country, how does the community view these AD plants? Do they see them in a negative light, like this is big, dirty gas? And it's like, well, actually, or is this decarbonization? Is this efficiently using our food waste? So in, in a town, are they sending all of their food waste into a local AD plant? And does the community buy into it to make sure that there's no plastic in that food waste, that it's high quality food waste? You know, because then now your cows are grazing organic nutrients that came from food. Because typically nutrients are leaving farms and going into cities and towns how does that nutrient come back out basically into the system? Um, and that's that's really where I see AD being the hub for nutrients and and manures. How do we process them and use them ef- effectively? If I suppose looking at it, if, if, I, if I was looking at it from a very hardened, purely economic perspective, uh, and I'm a, a farmer and my local co-op is interested in in uh, getting involved, uh, but taking in a number of investors as, as as farmers. Is this something that be- can become on top of that, uh, on top of the benefits you've talked about, a profitable investment? And what's it required for for, for that to happen? Uh, like econom- the economics, question, I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The economics <laughs> of AD are challenging, and that's why we don't have AD plants everywhere. Uh, and it comes down to the customers for gas. Fossil gas might be at four and five cent a kilowatt right now. AD biomethane, you're probably talking 10 to 12 cent a kilowatt. So the customer needs to pay more for it. Now, I do think we're now into transport that actually works. It, it's comparable to diesel in a, in a transport scenario. But all these large companies need to decarbonize and we're going to get an RHO. There's going to be a requirement that we need to start using biomethane. So that's from a customer point of view, if you could get 10, 12 cent a kilowatt for your biomethane, then yes, it becomes a viable proposition. And it has to be economic. This has to be an industry that stands up on its own feet. There are customers, slurry is being paid for, you know, silage is being paid for, and fertilizer is coming out the far side. Do you know? So that's yes, I, I would think there is there is the pathway there to making this an economically viable industry, basically. And it and it has to be, do you know? Yeah. Maeve, loads of questions coming in. Yeah, they're flooding in for you here, Morris. Um, so we might ju- I might just try and group a couple of them together, I suppose. Um, you know, uh, plenty of questions there in terms of kind of the transportation and, and the issues around the, the high dry matter and stuff like that. So I suppose just if you could talk through maybe like, 
I know you're saying like as high a dry matter as possible, but is there like an optimum dry matter percentage that you're aiming for or is it literally just as high as possible? And then in terms of, you know, the timeline of needing the fresh slurry, like you were saying, you know, two lorry loads a week sort of thing. Is that kind of the max timeline that you'd be happy for the slurry to be sitting in the tank or what would be the max timeline before kind of the methane losses would then, you know, nearly um, render it? Anyway, so yeah. the the higher, the better. So an AD plant will blend feedstocks together. So it'll get high dry matter solids from out of industry. So generally the slurry is the watery side of things. It's it's the solvent in the AD plant. So the higher, the better. But we're, we're talking eight, nine, ten percent is probably achievable in cattle slurry, do you know. But if you could get 15, they would take 15 because the more dry matter, the more methane on that lorry, basically. So that's the and now the negative and, and this is one of the things for farmers. I'm like, that's a problem to deal with through low emission systems. So generally, farmers aren't that worried about well, they're going to have to dilute the slurry anyway to spread it. So they're not that worried about water getting in. But if you're sending it off in a lorry, they are worried. They want as little water in there as possible. You'll be getting back a liquid that's been processed. It's going to be low dry matter. It's not going to clog your low emission systems. So it's a slightly different perspective. And I think if you, if it was incentivized that the AD plant was saying, look, 150 euro a lorry if it's above 8%, no cost if it's 6 to 8, and you're going to have to pay for it if you're sending us water. That, to me, makes sense. Yeah. It'd be clear signposts to the farmers. And uh, um, and what would be the opinion there, like, say, on, on the use of the likes of slurry separators, for example, you know, to actually remove out the, the more watery um, component of it? Yeah, another bit of analysis. Haven't done that yet. But, yeah, that's, that's what I think. Like, when you look at a strategy, right, we have 5.7 terawatt hours, and at most, they're talking 20%. I think it's in reality 8% of the cattle slurry in the country. That still leaves 90% that's not being touched. So yeah. I do think processing slurry will become a thing. I just haven't modeled it yet. And that's a bit of scope creep. Fleet 2, or, the, or if Chagas give me a nice job, I'll, I'll sort out that question, basically. Um, uh, I- the transport, sorry, freshness of slurry. Yeah. Look, if you that was kind of part of the analysis was looking, is it two lorry loads a week? That means the slurry is only sitting there for a couple of days. Now, there might need to be infrastructure change on farms because we haven't built our farms based around extracting slurry. But if people are building new plants, I would say keep an eye on this. See, could you actually design it so that you could suck slurry out fresh? Because that would make life much easier in the long term, you know. Um, But the fresher, the better. You don't want slurry sitting there for three months then the methane is going to be emitted. If it's a week, that's fine. If it's half a week, that's fine. And that's why I think this analysis kind of points to saying, look, we're in the realm of that's fine. There are additives to slow down that methane loss and stuff, but then how do you install that and run that and do all of that? Um, so the, yeah, there's there's lots of questions and lots of research that should be done and figured out, you know? Yeah, yeah. So a good bit done and more to, more to be done in the future yeah, yeah. as well. And then just in terms of the actual digested itself, like um, I, I know obviously, like you're saying, there's going to be um a, analysis done on that. So you'll know exactly what the nutrient value is of what you're spreading. But in general, you know, on average, what sort of nutrient content would you be expecting in comparison to, say, just slurry? Yeah, so you can be nearly double uh, the value. Sorry, your P and K is pretty similar. Uh, yeah. It's the nitrogen value. So in slurry, you've got an ammonia quantity, but it also have slow release carbon. The fundamental difference with digestate is that you've broken down some of that slow release carbon, and you've made it, and you've made more nitrogen available in the ammonia ammonium form. And so that's that's why it has a much more of a kick. It's a fertilizer. It's not a slurry. You're not having it seeing a delayed response on a crop. This is an instant response. And that's why I'm talking 15 to March. You, you don't want to be spreading this early in the season, you know, because you're just wasting nutrients like and that's bad for water quality, bad for everything. Uh, so generally, you'd nearly be talking twice the amount of nitrogen content. Uh, and that's where, you know, you're getting more bang for buck, basically, for spreading. Yeah, absolutely. And then in terms of the the form of spreading, then if you could just talk through that, is there any, um, well, what what's the method of spreading with the digested? Is there any spreading issues with it, um, for farmers? 
Uh, the only issues I've heard was a farmer was spreading it at his, uh, this wasn't in Ireland, it was in Scotland. A farmer spread it so thick that he actually burnt the grass. And that's because there's so much nitrogen in it. So that's, there is going to be different practices. You're not going to be, it's, we're not going to be talking about high application rates. Uh, and that's where once you know what's in it, you're going to need a thousand gallons, 1500, 2000 gallons to the acre, Do you know, and that's, but there's no, it's easier to spread digested and slurry because you don't have lumpy bits. It's being processed. It's being macerated. And you know what's in it, but you're talking the same low emission systems, dribble bars, you know, trailing shoes, stuff like that, injection if you want. But the other, it, the other interesting bit is that you can top dress um, arable crops with it. People put digested out in winter wheat. Wouldn't really be common in terms of slurry because there is nitrogen, but it's slow release and all of that. Whereas now you could actually see that, but you would need good systems, and that's like, are we like? You're talking about wide systems, good flotation tires, because you need to be careful of soil, all those other bits, you know, that's, um, so there's probably, there might be an infrastructure improvement required, you know, in terms of slurry equipment and capacity. And that's, and even you see the systems in the UK where like a lorry comes up to the side of the road, transfers it into a pipe, into the, the tractor unit, and then it goes spread. Lorry's goes back to base, collects another load, you know, and that's really efficient. That's a contractor coming in and you just said, I want this many kilos of N per hectare, spread that, and they go in and do it in a day. And we're not drawing small amount, small slurry loads around the place. You know? Yeah, yeah. But like you said, maybe just a bit of a tweak in the infrastructure, because especially with the movement towards the likes of dribble bars and trailing shoes and stuff, exactly like you yeah. said, it, it hasn't been so much a concern with water getting in. And even with the increased requirements there for soil water storage and stuff like that, I yeah. suppose maybe there was tweaks made to 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 drive down the dry matter of slurry to allow for spreading. So maybe that's where. Yeah. No, exactly. And, and I've experienced jammed. it. Do you know what I mean? Like it, jammed pipes is annoying. You know, yeah. that's, it's not something you want to be doing. You know, if you could add in a little bit more water for agitation, that's something you do. But this, it, you'd be coming back with a 6% dry matter, completely macerated. There's no, there should be no issues on it. And that's probably where I'm talking about these agri AD plants versus the food waste ones. If you're talking about a food waste plant or, you know, that's different. There is plastics, there is other stuff in there, which they're going to try and take out as much as possible. But I'm like, if we're talking about agri only plants, if we're building co-ops, which are slurry and silage, simple, nothing, nothing untoward going on. That's a pretty perfect fertilizer coming back out. There's no difference to that. Then. And the other one is smell. There's a lot less smell from digestate than slurry, basically. So people talk about the nuisance factor and it's like, well, actually, digestate is going to reduce the amount of smell. The, the neighbor passing and going, oh, that's a, that's a strong smell, you know? So that's, that's a benefit for the community in general, you know? I have an interesting question of maybe an unintended consequence. Uh, the Depart uh, Department of Agriculture under TAMS are, are, are proposing are, 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 and are working on, on a scheme for import of organic manures. But if this wasn't classified as an organic manure anymore, is it likely to be problematic in, in that space? But yeah, presumably yeah. that could be dealt with. Yeah, exactly. And and I think I think nitrates and daffin would be quite in, in uh, they'd be quite interested in this because it re it's reducing agricultural emissions. And that's it's very much, I think, these digestate storage tanks, how they're funded. I think they would need funding. But I think it, we're talking about it should really be funded for the out farms, not for the home block, you know, depending on sites and stuff. But if you've got a long term lease for 10 years, you should be putting in a temporary storage tank for digestate that, you know, contractor can drive up with your um, with their um or oh, dribble bar system or their umbilical system connect up to the tank and they just spread the whole farm nice easy quick do you know what i mean we're not seeing tankers on the road drawing tanks but that would be an infrastructure be putting in a temporary tank to basically take this digestate where it's needed but to me that makes a lot of sense so to me it would make sense that tams would follow that and, and make sure that this isn't yeah that this is you're not penalized for doing something that's positive for reducing greenhouse gas emissions there's, um, I suppose, a, 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 an issue or a, a, a challenge with some of the other ma uh, manures, the, the poultry manures, pig manures. Is there a, a prospect for mixing or for putting those into the mix in, in, in the uh, 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 in the digesters and in effect having those going back onto dairy farms, but will are onto to any kind of farm, but. Is there a, a, a potential fear or issue around disease diseases with that, or um, maybe yeah, particularly... I'm, maybe I'm pushing the the, yeah. the 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 biological part of the question rather than the economics? 
yeah. So look, uh, there would be generally concern out there around poultry litter and things like that. Yeah. Now, I, I would say that needs to be pasteurized and we do need to manage these. And But I think in general, we need to manage disease uh, and make sure that... I, I would be suggesting that probably before you supply slurry, that you actually have your slurry tested to see what are there pathogens in your slurry. Do you know what I mean? Rather than the blunderbuss approach of everything is pasteurized at 70 degrees, let's see what diseases are coming into the system and monitor it. You know, And now we could have a monitoring system because if you've it large and centralized, and to be honest, to me, it's also pig slurry is going out in farms at the moment. It's not pasteurized. Do you know? Uh, poultry litter is going out onto farms. It's not pasteurized. So can we use the AD system to increase the biosecurity in the country, make sure that risks are reduced and managed, basically? And just the point I make around pasteurization is it is a bit of a blunt instrument in some regards. It is required in certain instances, but let's manage it. Let's do work on it and let's see what the risks are and deal with the risks as they come. And more information is better than less information, you know. So that's that's really where I'd see the AD plant as managing different feedstocks, blending it together so that a farm, one farm isn't getting pig slurry, one farm's getting poultry litter and one farm's getting a different slurry. You're getting a blend which has a nice balance of nutrients, which makes it a good fertilizer, do you know? Maeve? Um, yeah, so just a couple of questions there um, coming in, Morris, in terms of like the timeline, you know, you're saying, um, you know, that it's in the discussion. should have started two years ago. That's the answer. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, um better I suppose that you know the best time was two years ago and the next best time is now sort of thing but um do you know uh, what sort of time I do envisage or um you know when is the consultation going to be closed and and when do you when would you hope to see these changes being put in place this well the the nitrate derogation runs out in April 26 so the time is against us here mm -hmm. uh, this came out in April um, and there's talk of September. There's, it's going to have to be talked about. They got a lot more consultation than they expected. Um, and, and there is kind of, it is a little bit of a hot topic. I, In terms of actually building these APD plants, that's another question. Can we actually get these built uh, and out into the system that a farmer can actually export it? On paper, this sounds great, but unless we have the AD plants, it's not going to happen. So, and this is also, the, there is planning delays in the system. Let's not lie about that. Um, but, if there's agri-AD plants, if it's only grass silage and slurry, I would be advocating that actually we probably need to have a simplified process. You're not talking about dealing with food waste. You're not talking about dealing with high-risk items. If this is an agri-based system, this should be a 12-month planning process. Now, you still need to get planning. You need, still need to get funding. There's a lot of work to be done. But I, I think if we kept a nice, simple process and it was agri-based, community-based, and we didn't have objections and people fighting over it, not in my area, if this was something that benefited the community, I think we could roll this out quickly. But I'm optimistic. If and this is this is why I'm advocating for this. I think farmers need to get involved in this. I think we need to be pushing the IFA. You need to be pushing everyone around you, saying, "Come on, we want this. Let's make this happen." Rather than at, to date, there's been a lot of reticence about it, saying that, "Oh, this is for someone else to sort out." It's like, no, we've got slurry. We could sort out our greenhouse emissions if we got our slurry into AD plants. Let's get involved and let's make it happen. And let's advocate for this in our communities. This is yeah. this is circular bioeconomy. Let's not let's not wait around. And and this is the feedback we got from Denmark and other places was farmers sat in their, on their hands, other people built these plants, and now they're saying, Oh, we miss an opportunity. So to me, I'm like, now is the chat, now is the time. Like we don't have these AD plants, we don't have an industry. So let's make the industry suit agriculture. That is a collaboration mm. between agriculture and energy rather than just a competition that you are you have a choice in where you send your feedstock, whether it's for food production or energy production. And that's you're not going to get an economic advantage if you're not, if you don't get involved. Jim. There's, yeah. there's a question there, which I kind of follows on from that. Is it only suitable for, for, for large farms? If you're hoping to send one lorry a week, you would need a, a herd of greater than 100 cows. But I think the point you were making about the 2.4, is it's not that you need 2.4, it's that's what's likely that's, to be coming from some of the big farms. I that's don't think just that, the average, right? Yeah. So, so a bigger farm with collecting yeah. once a week or once every 10 days, that's not a problem yeah. either. Do you know what I mean? It was just to kind of say, well, okay, what's the average? We should look at it in terms of small farms, medium, large, another bit of analysis to be done. But that's... I, and. That'll be the other one is like, how long, do you know what I mean? Is once every two weeks getting a little bit too long? But that's, I, I think this should be an option for small, medium and large farms, do you know? Because I, I, 
it shouldn't only be for the massive farms, you know, this should be an option for everyone. A question there, there's a question there in relation to the potential for uh, additives to, to um, reduce our, uh, our acids or additives to, to reduce the um, ammonia emissions. And it, is that a possible replacement for uh, having covered storage? Uh, no, covered storage is always good. That's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, no, acidification and and additives to deal with emissions as the digestion is spread back on land there is there is a potential for emissions now the point of a large centralized facility is that you could treat all of the digestate to reduce your emissions rather than each farmer trying to tip in uh, acid into their slurry but that's tank. what i mean uh, so yeah. but is it possible that that would happen centrally and and then that, that you don't need covered storage or kind of do you need both I, I think we need both. I, okay. I, you just want you don't want rainwater getting into it. You don't want it open because yeah. as mu- as good as an additive is, putting a cover on it is 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 better. Do you know what I mean? Sure. So that's I, I think we need more storage anyway for this digestate. I don't think we should be mixing it with slurry. It should be that's your lovely digestate store, and that's what that does. Do you know? And um, but no, additives is a very important part of this solution, and that's why I think if we have a centralized AD plant. We can treat the digestate to make sure we reduce our emissions, and that's I think that's a much safer option than each farm investing five grand in a treatment facility, and now they're dealing with acids. And no one that that health and safety risk is not nobody likes. You know, no one likes that. Idea. Farmers have, have have that experience with sulfuric acid at, at farm level. I, yeah. I don't think there's any appetite for that. Out there. You know what I mean? Whereas that's fine. You send it down the road. It's into a centralized facility. They deal with the the acidification and. And make sure and it comes back exactly as you need it that to me is more sensible and if you have to invest 20 50 grand and you have a shareholding in it that would make sense to me do you know number of questions about the the the, the feedstocks uh the, the uh, one around the the quality of silage needed uh another uh looking at i suppose the the biodiversity impact that if there's land which is is potentially uh currently farmed at, at maybe low stocking rates with with a high uh highly biodiverse uh swords is there a possibility that they will get into a high producing uh uh pasture for uh, silage for ad yeah so we've actually been looking at biodiversity and um, that's and the first one, yeah, sorry, fiber doesn't make gas either. You are looking at leafy grass, basically. Right. You do want you do want reasonable quality. You don't want a bale of rushes. That's that's not that's not going to make anyone gas. And it's not making anyone money, right? Um, so you do want good quality. There is the biodiversity. It sort of depends on where your what your starting point is. So if the if the soil has been plowed remorselessly, then there might actually be biodiversity benefits from putting in the putting in a grass clover multi-species for a couple of years and that's what it, it is a grass clover and it does need to be multi-species like it i don't think we're talking about it and even i'd be advocating for those higher nature value farms i don't think we need to reseed all of these i think we might need to add clover to the situation but i i'm just not advocating that we need to like rip everything out i think we can produce grass um and we can we can over sow to tweak the tweak the species comp- composition so that we're productive. But there's a big debate there between productivity and biodiversity. I think you can do both. That might be controversial, but I, I don't think it needs to be either or, you know. Um, but it, it's definitely, sorry, it's in red too as well. It, high nature value, we do need to be careful on, the, on that side of things, you know. I, you don't yeah. want to see ploughs going into places that shouldn't be ploughed. That's that's not a win. And, 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 and the other one, people talk about maize, and I'm like, no, we don't need bulldozers pulling silage trailers. That's not. We're we're good at growing grass, and um, so let let's let's grow good grass. Do you know what I mean? And good clover. Yeah, maize but they're trying to, to but they're trying to reinvent the wheel. Like, yeah. Um, but look at I suppose just a couple of questions there in terms of like the targets that are in place for um you know our, our climate targets for twenty thirty and trying to get two hundred anaerobic digesters up and running by twenty thirty like it's a it's a huge huge challenge, um so like I I know you're trying to encourage farmers to to get involved and get ahead of the game but in terms of then like policy support and stuff like that like what sort of role do you think policy is going to need to play in making sure that 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 we are at least you know getting close to achieving our targets by by then yeah look it, it is a big challenge um and i i think unless agriculture embraces this it's not going to happen to be honest do you know what i mean it'll happen for that first terawatt hour of food waste and everything else but it's 
I don't, unless farmers go for it. And government are also coy about this because agriculture is pushing back saying we don't want this. So I think until agriculture says we want this, they're not going to throw money at it. Do you know what I mean? And that's, it does require priming the pump. It is going to require funding. We do need to do it to reduce agriculture emissions. We do need to reduce Ireland's emissions. But as long as everyone keeps coming up to me saying, I don't like this AD plant, why? It doesn't benefit me. And it's like, no, it would reduce your emissions. It could allow you to keep farming without this derogation, Russian roulette. It's like, when is the derogation being renewed? Is it going to be renewed? This could give you an option to farm irrespective of that. And you don't need to go out renting land at high at high prices. So that's where I'm actually working at it the other way around and saying, we need farm organizations. We need farmers saying, we want this in our area. I want someone to come in and build this in this area because I've talked to the community and we all agree this can benefit the community. So then... That's, I think, the most important step. Once there's support for it, I think government would support it as well and say, listen, this is something we need to support. And as long as communities are supporting it, we will also put money into it because they're recognising they are going to need to put support into it, financial support. And this renewer is regulatory support. So till now, most dairy farmers have said, look, this AD plant's going to be competing with me for land to spread digestate. I don't want it in my area. And dairy farmers are ones objecting to AD plants. And what I'm saying is that, look, as long as these rules get tweaked so that it does and this does get passed, this could allow you do your business and actually help your business. So then you shouldn't be objecting it. You should say, can we get an AD plant in our community? Can we get lads together to do this and build it? Do you know, so that's yeah, okay. that's I, I'm putting the emphasis back on farmers. If we sit there doing nothing, who's to blame? Do you know, that's you know, it, it's fine to sit there and say government need to do more. I, I think agriculture needs to do more i think the co-ops need to get get active i think everyone needs to get active to make this happen you know and even if we get halfway there three quarters of the way there that'll be a phenomenal achievement you know that's absolutely and trying but try and get agriculture behind park behind the steering wheel really so that it's actually going in, in conjunction with what we want yeah and that's why i'm being provocative and i'm like if we let ad plants be built and you come up as a dairy farmer saying, will you take my 4% dry matter slurry? They're going to say, no, I've put 20 million into a plant. Why do I want to fill it with water? No. But if we are together with actually setting up that plant and say, Grant, we've got a base load of slurry. We're going to make sure it's 8% dry matter because change a few practices and we can get 8%. Then then the AD plant will take it all day long. Do you know what I mean? So mm-hmm. that's that's just a subtle difference. And that's why I'm, I'm blue in the face telling people it's like, Either we get active or the, the bus will leave and we won't be on it. You know? there's, a, there's a question in there about the, the, the seasonality uh, issue uh, where if we are looking at uh, purely fresh, uh, we're, we're talking about a four months or five months of the year where we will have access to, to fresh manures. Uh, is that is that I suppose viable to, to have them running for, for that part of the year or is it something that we have alternative uses for those plants or alternative uh, feedstocks in those plants. Yeah, feedstocks, and that's, and that's, look, the blend of feedstocks will probably shift throughout the year. Uh, cattle slurry isn't going to be 100% of the feedstock because we do have, we do have housed units when pigs and poultry. So, and then silage might be a higher proportion during the summer, principally, you know, because if we have the feedstock there and we don't have as much slurry. Now, the additives and the storage, how can we push that out as much as possible? So yeah, th- there's there's lots of questions, and and we are not the easy case to to study. Basically, if we pull this off, this will be pretty awesome. That's the a question. I and I know from my local area here, but uh, six or seven years ago, there was talks of uh, an AD plant being developed, and uh, an immediate reaction by the local community uh, to mobilise against it. If you're talking to a local community and and doing a, a I, I suppose an honest assessment of the impact, what would you be saying uh, are, are those th- those impacts and and are they real? Yeah. So look, the first thing is most people view, and Gort would be very famous on this. That's a food waste plant. So let's not put Agri AD in the same camp as food waste. Food waste is dealing with the waste from a city. That's fine. That's an industrial thing. If we're talking about Agri-AD, if it's just silage and and slurries, that's a very different plant. And what are we doing for the community? We're sorting out greenhouse gas emissions. We're creating jobs throughout the year. We're creating stable incomes and we're producing renewable gas. Now, I do think there needs to be a community side of it. There needs to be 
whether it's running biomethane buses, there needs to be community ben- benefits to these plants as well. And and I would say we need to talk with communities first. A lot of people have this suspicious, we'll put in planning and try and say nothing. And I'm like, no, we should talk to everyone and explain what it is. And that's what, if we want it, if the community wants it, that's great. And if the community says, no, you don't want it, that's fine. You don't want it. Do you know what I mean? And it's like, but if this sorts out, if this sorts out the emissions of agriculture in the area, agriculture is a driver of jobs in, in rural economies, right? But then if this also sorts out local industries emissions, it their scope trees, that's to do with long-term viability of a community. So I, I think it is complicated. There is a perception out there of AD plants as food waste and smell. And I'm like, well, no. And this is even a, a colleague asked me, he's like, do I need a pair of wellies to go into an AD plant? I'm like, no. These are clean. There is no muck nowhere in an AD plant because it's a, it's a business. This is run. This is clean. This is sealed. There is none of that going on. But that's a perception thing out there, you know, and that's there, there is a lot of work that needs to be going on. on and, and look, it's great that we have a signpost that people are talking about it because the more we talk about it, the more people get in and see an AD plant, the better, you know, that's. OK, maybe last couple of questions, maybe. Um, yeah, well, just a couple of questions then around, you know, the cost of, of establishing these AD plants and in terms of kind of returns then as well from them. Um, you know, what, what would the figures look like, Morris? Uh, big and scary. Uh, the big plants that they're talking about are like 20 million. So like this is why it's not an individual farmer putting in one of these plants. Now, there probably is scope if we were being... If, if we wanted only agri-AD plants, we could possibly make smaller plants, um, but it's still big investment, you know, and that's why it does need to be community. It does need a government support. It probably will need foreign investment, and that's why I'm really pushing the co-op side of things and say, Grant, do we all pitch in so that we're taking a tiny bit of risk as opposed to everyone taking large chunks of risk? The payback, that's another problem. Uh, you can go and raise money to go to, from a bank to do pretty much any industry. You go to a bank to to raise twenty million for an AD plant. It's like, well, what's what are you selling? Buy methane. What's the price of buy methane? We don't know because no one's selling it in the country. You know that's the problem and that's the risk basically. So it's yeah, it's not for the faint of heart. You know that's the yeah. now. I do I do think the RHO they are we are trying to shift it so that there is a viable industry. We've done it in every other country in Europe. So we should be able to do it and figure out how to do it here, you know, but it's not, yeah, it's not all roses, basically. That's that's one of the yeah. issues. And then just, you know, as I'm a signpost advisor going out to farmers on the ground, like what would you say is the main message then that I should be trying to to bring out to farmers on the ground with regard to, to these ADs? Look, the, the simple thing, A, positive message, B, it's that people have this perception out there. It's like, oh, well, I'm exporting the slurry, you know, and it's like, I need that to grow grass. And it's like, yes, because lorry delivers digestate, lorry takes slurry. This should be an in-out system, basically. And if you don't need that slurry back because you have enough nutrients, that's fine. AD plant can find another farmer that needs nutrients. So that's just on the slurry side of things. On, On the grass silage side of things, yeah, I think there is scope there that you can grow good quality silage. And that might suit certain farmers if, depending on your on on your stage in life or like out blocks or like retiring like do you know what i mean there might be a chance that you could actually reduce stock grow a bit more grass and that's just a nice stable income contractor comes in cuts tree cuts a silage so there is different types of farms and there's different types of ways that you could interact with but one digest it is great it's fertilizer it's not a slurry you need to be spreading it on a growing crop on warm soils do you know those those are probably the and and we have a perception thing around it's another one of watery slurry. They're like watery slurry doesn't contain anything. It's like, yeah, but if you've separated out the solids, you have all the available nutrients in it. So that's why we need the certificates and say, here's the NPK value. Stop having the perception and left the solids on the grass. That wasn't good slurry. It's like, no, this is you're gonna have to go off the certificate of analysis here and actually this is a precise fertilizer. And just just uh, you've talked about the the level of nitrogen. You uh, you will be getting a situation if this worked with a dairy farmer where they're exporting and I- importing it as uh, a chemical nitrogen. It will uh, reduce the amount of bad chemical nitrogen that would be using. Yeah. 
and presumably for farmers then to operate at the same level as they're operating now, it will have a requirement for better use of, of clover, better use of, of uh, uh, multi-species yeah. sward if they're wanting to produce the same level of, of grass because your total nitrogen into the system is 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 going down. Uh, yeah, yeah, if no, you exclude you, the, the, the sorry, you, we're not going to be as reliant on the bag of nitrogen. Yeah, Do you know exactly. what I mean? That is the thing. You're going to be using this digestate as part of your of your bag of nitrogen. But I think that's a positive overall. It's positive. We, Absolutely. Like, positive. We've, we've seen yeah. it in 22. We've reduced our nitrogen usage when it went to a thousand euro a ton. So we can do without it as much. It's not easy. Like it takes more management. And on a cold spring, we're waiting for grass to grow. Like this is there. There is risk and there is fear with it. I, of course, I accept that. But I think it's very possible. And if you see some of the good farms, like, and if you sort out like compaction, lime, micronutrients, all these other bits, like they're growing phenomenal stuff on very little nitrogen. So like, I, I, I think that is all doable. But this is, it is, will be senior hurling like this won't be, uh, <laughs> this won't be as easy as spreading the, the bag nitrogen, you know? Okay, listen, thank you very much. We're going to have to leave it there. We're a little, a little bit over time, but we've had a, a very large audience attending today and we've also had probably as many questions as I've ever seen coming coming in. Uh, so apologies to anybody whose questions we, we, we didn't get around to. And maybe uh, down the line, there'll be a, 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 an update possible uh, on, on what's happening here uh, and particularly and, in relation to trying to get this to, to, to move on. So thank you yeah, very much. And any, any questions, you can always fire me an email or, or a phone call and I'll... Yeah, I'll search Morris DC Chagas and you, you'll yeah. get your contact details. Okay, thanks very much, Morris. Thank you very much, Maeve. Uh, over the next uh, two weeks, we're, we're actually taking a, a summer break for, for the first time. So we're, we're not going to be with you next week or the week after. On the week of this, on, on the 16th of August, uh, we'll be looking and, and working with uh, colleagues in relation to Heritage Week. And we have uh, John G. O'Dwyer, uh, the chair of the, the Pilgrim's Pathway Project, and uh, Ronan Healy from the uh, project manager of Heritage Week uh, with us on the morning of, of, of the 16th. And I would just like to, to uh, uh, bring your attention to a, a farmland biodiversity event, which we're going to be running uh, in Burcastle on the 28th of, of August. So you're all welcome to join us there. Uh, any of you who are familiar with Burr Castle, they, they have uh, um, pasture land there or, or uh, uh, species rich grassland, which are absolutely exemplary, exemplary and will be using that as a base for the, the event on the 28th of, of August. So we'd love to see you there. Details will be coming up in the in the uh, 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 extra file. So thank you very much for, for joining us. Enjoy holidays anybody who's taken them and we'll enjoy ours and thanks to all my my team who uh, have worked diligently over the last uh, 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 number of years uh, and are now for the first time getting a little a little break so see you in two weeks you've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk signpost series the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in irish farming don't forget to join us live every friday morning for our latest webinar for more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review, and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.